it's pretty wonderful. And uh, it's really sad, but I do think it's an extraordinary achievement that we're here because this is actually uh, a very important conference and a very important moment uh, in human history because we're engaged essentially uh, in a struggle between wisdom and barbarism. Uh, we have on the other side uh, the macho philosophy, the view that struggle is the most important thing in life, uh, competition is much more uh, desirable uh, than cooperation, uh, that people should be fighting not only against other organizations, they should be fighting against their colleagues for performance-related pay. Uh, they should be given performance targets which they can barely uh, rely on meeting. They get more and more stressed. Uh, we have schools being turned into exam factories. There are some terrible tendencies in our society which are based essentially, actually, on bad economics coming out of American business schools. Uh, and, of course, the reason which is always given in support of all of these awful things is it's good for the economy. Uh, but who's the economy? <laughs> there isn't, it's not a person. Uh, the economy exists for us, not we for the economy. Uh, and so we have to base uh, what we do on what uh, humans need. Human need has got to be the guide. So what have we got going for us? Well, we've got the best idea of the modern age. And actually the central idea of the modern age which brought the Middle Ages to an end was the idea uh, that you would judge a state of affairs uh, by how happy people were in that state of affairs. Were they enjoying their lives? Were they flourishing? Uh, was that uh, the kind of life uh, that they wanted to be leading? I think that is a wonderful uh, idea, basic philosophy of the Anglo-Saxon Enlightenment. Uh, and of course, it, it, it tells you the two basic principles of political and moral philosophy. It says for, for political philosophy that the job of the government uh, is to uh, create conditions for the greatest possible happiness and especially for the least possible misery. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, as you know, said that there was no other role for the government Quite right. I can't think of any other role for the government uh, than that. Uh, I don't know who else can, but uh, they've never persuaded me. Uh, and of course, for our own lives, for uh, moral philosophy, uh, it also provides a guide. How should we live? We should live uh, so as to try and create as much happiness as we can uh, in the world around us uh, and as little misery. And that's a very, very simple moral precept which I would love every child uh, in the world to imbibe because it's inspiring. What is so terrible about the age that we live in is that because of a sort of moral void, uh, children are increasingly told that their main obligation is to make the most they can for themselves. Uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, to justify your existence, you've got to succeed, you've got to do well in some way or other uh, relative to other people. That, of course, is a zero-sum game, uh, uh, an absolute formula for zero social progress. So we've got the, we've got the most powerful idea uh, that anybody could have. Uh, and one might ask, I think it is a bit puzzling, why didn't that idea just take over from the 18th century onwards? Uh, and I think the reasons are partly uh, that there wasn't the science. There wasn't the science of what, was, what, uh, what causes happiness uh, that you could then put in behind the general principle. Um, but there were also some very bad other philosophical ideas uh, that struggle is intrinsically good, um, which of course uh, are largely responsible for the European Civil War in the first half of the last century. So some very bad ideas that drove us off course, and they're still there in as I said, in the macho philosophy uh, that is being practiced, not as between countries, thank God, yet anyway, but as between uh, organizations and individuals. Uh, and this uh, failure to stick with the original 18th century idea also infected economics. Uh, economics actually was meant to be about creating the conditions, especially the, the economic conditions, 
uh, for the greatest happiness. Um, but they were undermined by psychologists saying you couldn't know if people were happy or not. Uh, and, uh, of course, if you can't, uh, the only thing you could fall back on is, well, have they got enough money? Uh, so GDP uh, became the god of, of economics um, because of the failure to uh, push forward uh, on the original program. Now, I think we are now really well placed to reverse this um, and to uh, build a more civilized society. Uh, science is on our side, and I'll say a bit about that. Um, and we're beginning to get organized. But organization is incredibly important. I mean, Lenin was, <laughs> he, was <laughs> he knew a thing or two. You've got to be organized if you want to win uh, even an intellectual battle. Um, so I want to say something about science, uh, and I want to say something uh, about organisation. Now, the science has gone quite well as far as explaining, um, in particular, why some people are, 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 are much happier uh, and some people are much more miserable. Uh, we've been involved in this sort of work uh, at LSE um, <clears throat> and um, uh, have produced a book uh, using a very large number of surveys in different countries, uh, you find exactly the same pattern. Root has always been saying this. Human nature is pretty much the same everywhere. Uh, you find very much the same patterns uh, in all countries. Uh, income explains a very tiny fraction of the variation uh, in happiness uh, within any community, never more than 2%, typically 1% uh, of the variation. The things which explain the huge variation in happiness within any population are on the external side, uh, people's human relationships, always whether they have a decent family and a stable family situation uh, is the top thing. Also relationships at work are important uh, and of course relationships uh, in the community. But then on the inside of course, uh, there's your physical health uh, and above all, your mental health. And uh, I've been absolutely amazed, and we show it in this book, uh, that in every advanced country, the single biggest uh, determinant uh, of the variation of people uh, from great happiness to great misery uh, is the state of their mental health, not their physical health, their mental health. If only health care uh, planners uh, and spenders <laughs> Uh, would take some note, that would be a great improvement. Um, I'll just mention one other finding for the, the general causes um, of uh, whether an adult uh, is experiencing a satisfying life. Uh, it can be got by looking back to their childhood, of course, because we, we know that, to a large extent, the adult is the product of the child. Um, so you can think of three different dimensions of child development, their academic development, uh, their behavior, uh, and their emotional development. Uh, and it won't surprise you uh, if I tell you uh, that as a predictor of whether you know, your children <laughs> will have happy adult lives, uh, their academic success is not a great predictor. The great predictor is their emotional health in, in childhood. Uh, and yet our schools hardly see that as any part of their, their, their responsibility uh, at the moment. So some obvious policy, broad policy implications follow from all of this. Uh, we must have much more attention to helping people uh, with mental health problems. Uh, and we've got good treatments and uh, we've developed a good, particularly good program in Britain for rolling out uh, effective treatments like cognitive behavioral therapy for mental health problems. But we've also, also got to prevent mental health problems arising in the first place uh, through much more uh, civilized schools which have child well-being uh, as an explicit goal of the school. I would like to see child well-being measured in schools. Uh, schools would be uh, then assessed on how well they improved the well-being of their children as well as their academic performance. <clears throat> and so on. One could go on about this at some length. But I would say that although we know in general a lot about what causes happiness, 
we don't know much about what the specific effects would be of particular things we might do. So we will only win this battle when we've done, I would say, thousands of proper controlled trials, as the medics have done, to establish what we are offering people uh, as something which has a really uh, scientific uh, basis for what we're actually telling people to do. We can tell them what sort of, sort of issues to address, but we've got to be able to tell them also exactly what to do. That is years and years of work. Now let me come to organization. <laughs> and um, uh, obviously, we're talking about governments and we're talking about people. Uh, there has been a remarkable amount of movement at the governmental level. Um, it seemed to have got a bit stuck uh, until uh, this year, or last year. Um, the big thing last year, for me, was the uh, decision by the OECD uh, that uh, the uh, objective uh, of government, of members, member countries' policies ought to be the well-being of the people. I mean, this is quite a, an epic uh, uh, statement uh, to be being made. It's got to be carried out, <laughs> but to even have it made is an amazing step forward. Um, the World Happiness Report is having some impact. Uh, we're going to see on Monday a really important initiative uh, from the uh, United Arab Emirates uh, at the global level uh, on the policy front. That will be important. And, and this conference and the fact that it's going to happen uh, again and again is also incredibly important. So I think we're, we're on our way uh, at the, uh, the public uh, policy level. Um, but in the end, of course, uh, what happens will depend on the millions and billions of people in the world, how they lead their lives, and indeed also what they expect from their politicians. So let, let me just say a bit, a bit uh, about how I see the situation uh, in relation to individuals. I think that, let's, let's just think of the West. I think the, the typical person in the West would in previous periods um, have gone to church. Uh, and they would have got um, some comfort from it uh, and a feeling that, that somehow things weren't as bad as they seemed. Um, and they would, of course, got some inspiration to lead a more noble kind of life and to, to uh, direct their efforts uh, in the interests of other people as well as themselves. Uh, and that, that was an important uh, element of the culture of the past. Um, but that culture, has, in, certainly in Europe, has basically, basically finished. Um, people don't go to church. Um, somewhat more complicated um, in the Americas. Um, but uh, there is increasingly a moral void... Uh, and, of course, what goes into it, <laughs> Carrie was pointing out, is the philosophy of Ayn Rand. Really, the only thing you can do is look after yourself. If everybody looks after themselves, it won't be too bad. Um, that, of course, is a terrible philosophy because it will make, them, make people very, very unhappy. I mean, if, you're, if, you, you, if you feel you have a terrific obligation to yourself to, to, to get and to have... Um, it, it's a, it's a it's, um, pretty uncomfortable uh, and lonely-making operation. Because no, why would anybody else help you on that route? So we absolutely have to have uh, some new ethical system that doesn't rely on the divine will, but relies on human need, uh, uh, but has the emotional power that the old ethical systems have. Uh, and I think, I hope, that the idea that you try to create as much happiness in the world as you can in how you live, I hope we can get enough emotional power behind that idea. I mean, it is a, it is a bit dry. <laughs> it has a problem. Many people think it's too dry. And of course, it has to be implemented in all sorts of um, sub-rules uh, uh, of thumb as the, the so-called two-stage 
utilitarian philosophers have always pointed out. So we've got to, we've got to put, put a lot of emotion behind this. But the, the basic idea that you're living to create a happy world around you, I think it's an it's, it's extraordinary idea. I think, I must say, since I started believing it really seriously, I hope it's influenced my behavior. Uh, I mean, you, you take, you've got to take your relationships of every kind with strangers, with your colleagues, with your family. You've got to take all your relationships much more seriously as central products, not as things which are supporting what you're really doing, which is your great work, um, but as things which are themselves the, the end product of your life. Um, so, are we going to be able to, to crack the macho philosophy? I think that it is not making people very happy, um, and people have a spiritual hunger. Uh, and we can see that they are already reaching out in various ways to satisfy uh, the, uh, uh, the hunger that they experience. Um, Sri Sri was mentioning how many Oriental practices are becoming very, very widespread. It's probably the case in Europe that more people meditate than go to church. Uh, but it's still a minority. Um, and what we uh, are, are looking for is organizational structures that perform some of those roles that the church has performed, but do it better, um, in giving people a vision of a good life and, and keeping on reminding them, because people meet regularly in these structures, um, what, it is, what, what, the, what they are trying to do, um, share experience, uh, provide mutual support, uh, and so on. So one of the organizations which um, I've been involved in, and Mark is going to say a lot more about it, uh, is a movement called Action for Happiness. So that comes straight from the philosophy I mentioned. If you go into the, the web <laughs> for Action for Happiness, you will be invited to become a member. And to become a member, you have to pledge to try to create more happiness in the way that you live and, and less misery. That, that is the absolute essence of what it's about. Uh, there are 10 keys as to how you can uh, go about that, which Vanessa, I think, is going to talk about at some point. Um, but the, the, the key, I think, has got to be not to rely on um, virtual communities. I don't think virtual communities are going to be the answer for the 21st century. I think they are not part of the fundamental human need, which is face-to-face -face, uh, relationships which have a warmth uh, and a, a, a comfort uh, in them which uh, nothing virtual does. Uh, and we are in Action of Happiness building uh, communities that meet, community organizations, community groups that meet regularly um, ar around the ideas of the movement. We've got some, uh, a wonderful course that can start these groups off and so on. Um, but I would love to hear in this really interesting audience here about any other organizations that are trying to do this because <laughs> this is one of the world's great needs. There must be lots of people trying to meet these needs in different ways. Uh, clearly, the Art of Living uh, Foundation is one of the biggest uh, attempts to satisfy this need. But I really hope perhaps in the discussion afterwards we could share some experiences because uh, this movement, which we all feel part of, it won't move, <laughs> it, won't work, it won't succeed uh, unless it, it has power, strong organizations uh, within it. Why do I know that we will win? Um, if you try to explain why there has been this turnaround uh, in the last 50 years in the attitude to happiness, obviously a bit of it is a disillusion with economic growth. Uh, a bit of it is the new science. But I think that there's one really powerful influence, um, which is much more important than anything else, which is the increasing influence of women in our society. Uh, and women have always paid more attention to human relationships uh, than men. Uh, women are becoming uh, much more uh, powerful uh, leaders of opinion uh, in our society, and uh, that will happen even more, uh, and that's why we'll win. Thank you.